All right. Hi, everyone. It is the Sandy and Ken hour, which we do once a week. And today is a stand up day. Today is a full body Zoom day. He's been working out this body oh, all day. All day. All day. Okay. So, when we look at how to actually own your brand, your personal brand, part of your brand is your presence, it's how you come out and show up. And today we want to talk about showing up and owning your body, your positioning. So it shows your confidence and it shows that you own the crowd, the room, or whomever you're talking to. And standing in presence is numero uno, one of the most important things. People judge you on your posture and positioning and your presence. Absolutely. And today is a very important day because last week we showed Sandy's launch on her site, what she did. And part of it is how to show up, how your presence is. And today, everybody uh, in metal, we are going to go through what it takes to stand up and own your space. Um, posture, guys. By, by the way, I, I try to maintain this seating posture all the time. You do that okay? very well. You know, because a lot of us, because we, we're uh, behind our laptops or slumping over, you got to make sure you own that because it carries through with what you're doing when you're not in front of anyone. When it's just you, you start to slunch over. You're going to start getting, Bob, you've been behind your laptop for the last three weeks. Yes. How conscious are you of proper posture? Very conscious because when I don't sit properly, my back starts to hurt so bad I can't take it anymore. Yeah. And so I actually have an elevated keyboard, an elevated computer, so I am looking with my neck as straight as possible as opposed to like this. So I don't work like this. I work like this. Yeah, that's right. You do. Yeah. You deliberately have something to make sure you're looking forward. And I'm at a standing desk with a really high chair, so if I want to sit, I can, and when I don't, I just stand, and it's perfect. Okay, so today is full body Zoom day. We want to see you today, too. So part of this is you getting out of your comfort zone, moving your laptop or whatever you use as your camera so we can see your body, your everything. All right, Sandy, when I stand, I notice that when I stand, I have a tendency to move. I'm like this. Oh, uh, head's cut off? I want my head cut off. Is it cut off there? Get off. It, it gets set up. We're looking at my body, not my head, girl. It's my body. We're looking at my body. Let's see. I got to see it right here. Let's go spotlight. So when I see... Stand... No I have head. <laughs> but, but is the head important? Very. Oh, okay. Let me zoom out just a little. Stand up so you can see your body, girl. Let me see. Come on. All right. How's that? Yep, that works. Woohoo, we can see the full body. Let's do it. Okay, got it? Got it. Okay, full body. So when you stand, yes. I notice that you do a lot of this. Well, you do a lot of this. You want to create angles. Now, I stand for the camera. So whenever I see a camera, I know I'm going to be in front of a camera. I'm like, what's my optimal angles? <laughs> do you have optimal angles? Yes, of course. Do women have optimal compared to guys? Yes. Okay, what well, no, we women and, well, yes, in a way. So ultimately for a woman, we don't want to stand like this because it's not flattering. My butt goes flat, my belly shoulders. looks big, my shoulders look slouched. It's just really not flattering. Okay. So for a woman, when they stand, you want to elongate the spine, the neck, stick out the butt, bend the knee a little bit, pull those shoulders back, and it overall gives you more shape and makes you look better and adds more curve in the right places. <laughs> How about guys? So for guys, guys tend to stand like this as well. They slouch. The slouching position, it just really sucks, guys. We don't want to see you walking like that because it makes us think you don't have any confidence, you're tired, you're bedraggled. It just is not good. So correct that posture by, first of all, keeping your hips. Over. You go for it. Your, you want to be hip width apart, so your feet have to be planted. You don't want your feet too close together, and you don't want them so broad that you're like, yeah, right? So nice hip width apart. And then for guys, it's about lifting that chest. So you really want to just lift. So you're going to roll your shoulders back and lift the chest. Chest comes forward because it represents that you have nice full pecs. Even if you don't, you can give the illusion of having nice full pecs by just lifting that chest. And it straightens up and it lifts. Because when you lift the chest, it also, also lifts your buttocks. So that looks better than this. You want to do that. So lifting the chest is really key for guys. And then just having those feet nice width apart and kind of like owning it. I call it the man swagger. It's mm -hmm. where they kind of walk around like they're like, yeah, I'm just going to own that. And they kind of rest on one hip. Not that they're doing this, because this is very feminine. You want to just slightly rest. So you give some movement to the knee and just kind of own it. And walk with your chest forward. 
Think about it. It looks so much better. Rocky does it. You know, how about guys? Sorry, guys, I hate to say this. How about the guys out there that have uh, Corona guts? Okay. They if got you that have belly. a gut, gut, if you have a belly, the best thing to do, again, is to lift the chest because what it does is it takes this to this. So you're giving the illusion that your pecs are going further than your tummy. Now, if your tummy sticks out so much, this will still make an improvement. I mean, you're still, well, you gotta face it. If you got a belly, you got a belly. You just own it and love it and love that be the belly. But, you know, by lifting your chest, you're gonna help minimize the belly. Same thing for women. If a woman has a gut, just lift your chest, lower your shoulders back, and stick out your butt. So you wanna counteract that belly. You wanna make things go the opposite way. How about a, uh, a woman that has a big butt? Then own it and shake it. <laughs> Now, again, this whole premise of today is to make sure your posture and your presence is done right. So I wanted to go through this whole idea of when we go into a room, what do we do to own that room, own that audience? And then, obviously, Sandy's talking about how to stand. So when someone's looking at you, because you know what happens every once in a while, when you pass a conference room, you go, oh, I wonder what's going on in there. You can't hear anything because the glass is there, but you peek in, and the ones that have the right posture are standing there, you're going, I gotta meet that person. Okay. That person's doing something, they're, they're on in that room. So the visuals connect. So we have two things that are going on. We have the visual and we have the audible, the, the words that are used, the way that they're, they're said to get that audience enticed, okay? You know who's a perfect example of this? Seneca Street. Oh, uh, Seneca's great Whoever at Whoever knows Seneca knows that given he's like six foot four bajillion, yeah. He is so tall, which immediately commands presence. But there are a lot of guys who are super tall that slouch, and they come down to you. So they're, instead of walking in the room like this being tall, they walk in the room like this, kind of trying well, to... But they do that deliberately head. because they're trying to even themselves they're out. They're trying to make themselves smaller. But if you watch Seneca walk into a room, mm -hmm. he owns it. His chest is up, his shoulders are back, his hands are away from his body, and he has his man swagger. And he walks in, he's taking up space. So to really own and command a room as a man, you want to take up space. It's kind of like when you see a really buff guy at the gym and he walks in everyone kind of backs away from him because he's claiming his space. So it doesn't matter what your body looks like, even if you're not six foot four, six foot six, whatever Sneak is, you can still claim that space with how you walk in the room. But talk about this idea of coming in but not showing arrogance. Because I think there are, let's go back to that gym idea. Those guys are dicks. Yeah. You know, it's like, yeah. that guy's an an a-hole just by looking at them because they have a cocky attitude as opposed to a confidence attitude well that goes with something more than just owning the stakes and walking in so if you see those really buff guys you can tell the difference between the really buff guys that claim their space are super confident versus the ones who are arrogant like the rock he's really confident exactly he's welcoming exactly and that has to do with how you present yourself forward in terms of do you smile do you connect with people do you say kind things how do you engage? Are you kind of like snubbing your nose at people or being short or being condescending? And speaking of condescending, haha, <laughs> so this is for guys. <laughs> Believe me, women know when they're being condescending. We will say things. Like we're being snarky, like stabbing that knife. But for guys, they've actually done studies that guys cannot hear when they are condescending. They've actually, they, it's a tone, it's a tone. And there are some men who, physically cannot hear it. So you might be condescending without even knowing it. So if that happens, think back, has anyone ever said you are condescending? And you're like, I'm not condescending. I'm not condescending at all. Well, if you've been told you're condescending and you don't think you are, chances are you're condescending. So what do you do to fix that? <laughs> so you just have to work on your tone and trying to be a smart ass. So what it sounds like is if people are telling you that, that's a damn good indicator that you are. And you just can't hear it. Ooh. Okay. <laughs> So here's what I want to do. First, if anyone has, I guess, first the space to do this, put in the chat that you would like to go through a posture critique, okay? Put in the chat right now that you are able to do that. Okay. You screen down here. We're, you're looking, screen we're down looking at different screens right here. <laughs> so if you can, put it inside the chat that you're able to do that. So we want to see your screen. We want to see your body. But you have to put it in there so we can unmute you and put you in, okay? So who wants to do a posture critique on the way you look? You see some people standing up. That's not good enough. We want to hear from you. So let's see who this is. I'm going to go over here. Uh, I don't want to lose your head. That's Alan. Alan, Alan, are you up for this? 
I guess Alan let's is. Let's see. Let's see. Okay. Let's let's. Uh, I'm gonna make Alan full screen, and let me uh, cancel spotlight. All right, Alan, you are going to be full screen right now. You ready? Am I getting fuller? All right, Sandy, you want to take a stab at Alan? Yeah. Go for it. All uh, right, Alan. A stab. A st <laughs> All right, let's turn you to the side. Let's see how you stand overall. He's actually really good. So he's got his nice, his chest is lifted. I up. would relax your arms a little bit, so shake him out. And then roll your shoulders back a bit and let them sit back. So you don't want to wear your shoulders as earrings. You want to just let them relax back. Beautiful. And then I would lift the chest a little bit more. When you lift your chest, see, see what you just did there? Yeah. You sucked in your gut a little bit. And look how nice that looked. So <laughs> suck in the tummy a bit. I'll take your word for it. Perfect. And then take your top of your head to the sky. So stretch your neck like you're reaching for the stars at the top of your head. Like a marinette. You're giving your neck some length. Look at that. That's so much better. Now turn back to me. Hip width apart. And I want you to kind of rock on one hip just a bit and bend the knee slightly on the opposite leg. And then go on the elliptical behind you. Perfect. Now relax those shoulders just a bit and elongate the neck. Beautiful. And then bring your chin forward, only your chin, just a hair, and down a bit. There you go. That's beautiful posture makes, right there. It makes a difference, doesn't it? Totally makes a difference. Good job, Alan. Good job. Good job. Just, now practice that. I'm Julia Marquise. What happened? What happened, Alan? No, I just have to get uh, do what necessary to get my hips to loosen up. You know, I, that's, that's a crutch. You know, it's that's, I'm glad feel. you said that. Having mobility in your hips is one of the most important keys to having great posture. So we don't think about it. We sit for a lot. We do repetitive exercises like biking, walking, but we're not actually getting mobility in our hips. So just like you said, it kind of, you can feel how tight it was, right? So mobility exercises are really important to do hip stretches. It's hip stretch. So exercises that'll really loosen up your hips. Sure. So, so you've seen like those exercises where people at the gym are doing like this. And you're like, that guy looks like a weirdo. I do this in line at grocery stores, okay? <laughs> but this is a really great exercise to sort of just loosen up those hip flexors and those hip joints. So pretty much anything, lift your knees. You could do, you could do side bends. When, what I like to do are rotations where you go like this, where you do hip rotations. It loosens up the lower spine. And then anything to add mobility to the lower back and to your hip flexors. So you just want to get them moving. But Sandy, how do you make a, concert, a concentrated effort that you are always standing properly? Because Alan just showed what he did. That was almost un uncomfortable yeah. initially. Yeah, it, it, and actually it's funny because I put my clients through this when we do their personal branding photo sessions. And at the end of the day, they tell me that they felt like they went through the toughest yoga class they've ever gone through. And that's from a day of posing because I constantly have them doing this. So for me, I'm so used to doing this now, it comes natural. You'll see me in public, I stand like this. I'm on stage, I stand like this. I don't have to think about it. It's something that the more you practice it, the more natural it becomes, and then you build those muscles. So in the beginning, it's going to be uncomfortable. It's going to be tight in places that you didn't expect. You're going to have stiffness sometimes. And it just is something that you have to practice. And the more you practice it and you just become mindful of it, the easier it becomes. But so if you're standing in line at the grocery store, if you're going to a doctor appointment, if you're on a Zoom call, practice your posture because it's a good opportunity to let your body sort of sink into it and get familiar with the poses. And uh, bad habits ruin this. Let me give you a really bad habit many of us do. You ready? Oh, my God. You're on your phone, you do this. No, you are doing things that are almost reprogramming everything we're learning right now, and that is going back to things that we should be doing, how we hold our phone with our ear in our, our, our shoulder. Having a laptop in your lap is probably one of the absolute most damaging things you could do to your body. Just you're like. like this, you're like this. Head. So your head's coming forward, looking down, your shoulders are coming forward, and it's not at eye level. This is so damaging, I can't even begin to tell you that this is what it causes extreme back pain, neck issues, trauma. This is what is going to mess you up. So ideally, like I tell Ken, if he's sitting on the couch and he's watching TV and he's trying to work at the same time, I actually would rather him go like this. Which I do. And work than sit like this and work. Because at least that neck is supported. Okay, back to this. We want to make sure just a few extra tips 
So you are always concentrating. Again, look at Sandy, how she's sitting. She's making sure that lower back is elongated. We have to do this, everyone, because we're going to be spending more and more time in Zoom meetings than we will in actual meetings. Yeah. So we have to be constant, constantly um, updating our minds that our backs are straight and our chins are not going to look like this, but looking forward because we're going to get uh, neck pains and lower back pains. There you are little that? devices that you can have that attach to your back that'll like, like vibrate and or beep and remind you that you're doing this and you should be doing this. Okay. Now I want to talk about media training. So I've, uh, I've been hired to coach many CEOs and, uh, executives of publicly traded companies on how to handle themselves when they walk in front of somebody that is in the media, that is looking for body gestures, facial gestures, just to give enough of a tell to know that they're either lying, lying or not giving enough information or something they can go after. Because people in the media, I'm one of them, we look for those little micro gestures to go after to give us a sign to show that either we're getting deeper with what they're thinking or they're not accurate. Here's a couple of things. First, hands. Hello, hands. What do we have a tendency to do when we're worrying? We do things like this. We do things like this. We scratch, we fumble, we move our hands around. If you ever notice people when they're giving a very, very important speech or they're in front of an organization of people that are looking at them, they do this or they do this. They keep their hands in a place to where they're not fidgeting. And I want you what? It builds trust. Well, it builds trust with your hands in front, not in your pockets, not behind. But it also makes it so they're not moving around. They're not doing their own thing. Alien hands are insanely dangerous to you. Alien hands. That's what they are. <laughs> Can we do that? Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Oh, you're still sweaty. Okay. No, I can't <laughs> stop. I'm trying to have you do stuff. So I want you to understand that during these Zoom meetings, people are watching your hands. If you're a half Sicilian like me, this is good. I'm moving around. I have a purpose with these hands. They're part of my body language. But when they're nervous, they do things like tap on stuff. Boy, have you heard that? Oh, the worst is when you're doing a podcast and your guest is tapping. Sandy does a, yeah, she does a podcast where people come in her studio and the microphone's right in front of the guest. And they might be tapping the desk, which you hear through the microphone, which of course gets captured in the recording. It's like, ah! And the tapping gets more intense the more nervous they are. So you have to pay attention to these little critters right here because they can take you on a ride you don't want to go to that direction. You need to control them, okay? And on these Zoom calls, everyone, please pay attention to your hands. I've noticed something in people's Zoom calls. The whole thing about, oh, it doesn't matter if we're wearing pants or not. It does. <laughs> yes, it does. It does. it does. We've seen some pocket brains going on with some of you guys. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want to see your snake in the grass. Yeah, and it's so happening. <laughs> well, not just in the pants. It's good to actually be dressed on those important Zoom calls. Presence is everything. I've actually been chastised because even there are, I have a small Zoom meeting every day at 9 30 every day and it's only for 15 minutes and i don't dress up for those and i need to because i know my attitude will be different even the simple collared shirt is going to make a difference you guys i think you've gotten too comfortable in your zoom calls like for example on saturdays when you show up for metal on saturdays remember there's some pretty important people in those rooms and they're dressing not dressing up where they're wearing suit and tie but they're not wearing a shirt that's been on the floor for a week, it's got more wrinkles than most hundred-year-old men. You have to be more conscious of this, guys. Don't you agree? Oh, totally. Have you noticed? Everything. How you show up. How you do one thing is how you do everything. Absolutely. So if you show up in a sloppy manner, then people just assume that you're sloppy in other things. Okay, let's. Get, we're gonna go with uh, Joette says it's hard when you're Italian. No, your hands are part of your communication when you're Italian. Actually, okay. Thank you for saying that, Joette. Hands are really important. What Ken is saying, let me clarify the difference. Nervous fingers versus intentional. So you'll see when I speak, I use my hands a lot. Yes. I use them to gesture, I use them to make emphasis, I use them to create size variation and dynamic and show what I'm doing. So I use my hands, that's not nervous hands. Nervous hands is when you're sitting with someone, you're having a conversation and your thumbs are twitching. It's when you are fixing things that aren't conscious. You're not consciously going, oh, wow, my shoes, um, my, my shoes just came off. It's 
unconscious adjustments and fidgeting, oh, fidgeting and playing with your hair and it's unconscious stuff. So we're not talking about Italian gestures that we love. And and there was an old school of presenting back in the day, which was Toastmasters, for example. They used to say, I used to be a Toastmaster. I was the vice president of my chapter of public relations. I'm just saying. But in <laughs> Toastmasters, they actually taught us to keep our hands still. So if we were presenting, they wanted your hands like this, on a podium like this, yeah. at your side like that's this. Like beginner level. You could do a little bit, but that's what they practice. I know, because they want you to know where your hands are. Exactly, to know where your hands are. And now it's it's morphed into more people want to use hands to bring the audience in. To I, I think we need in. to on Zoom now. We need to make sure we know what our hands are doing. Exactly. And that is either being part of the dialogue or not taking away from the dialogue. Hey, Bill Ryan, I want to talk to Bill. Bill, you have managed some of the biggest names. I'm not sure if you know this. Uh, people like Steve Jobs were his clients. Uh, Mark Cuban, his client. Brock Pierce, who's running for president, one of his clients. Bill, what advice do you have to these guys when they're out there public speaking to control the camera and control the audience? What advice and words or tips do you give them? Well, no, you well, have to I, unmute yourself. No, no, no. Um, no, you got it. There you are. Okay. Uh, that's a, a, a good question. I think, um, <clears throat> first of all, it depends on um, what you, you have to understand what is the, the context of the experience. So, so right now, both of you are looking at me into the camera. Okay. And so I have that, that, you know, it's this kind of intimate thing back and forth. However, if you were on television, you know, Sandy, you may be interview, interviewing him. Okay. Yes, exactly. And so, what you don't want in that situation is to be looking at the camera because it breaks the um, it it breaks what the experience is. Okay, and so um, so I think that that it what's really important is to know at any moment in time what is the dynamic that's going on. Now here in say you know so and I actually got a question too for you is that um, in Zoom. I'm just looking here at everybody else and everybody else, this camera is from here to here. You know, all, everybody on that I can see, right. everybody from here to here. My question is, so I, you, you can't really see if I'm twitting my fingers or anything like that. However, um, that if I look at you guys, you are showing your whole person. So I was kind of curious what your thoughts were in the context of Zoom about, how far back should the how how far back should this should you see my whole self should you see me from here up and um and you know in that and and so I, but my my point is is that the first thing you have to understand is the context in which that interview is going on now in in typical television you know you know like if steve was on if was steve was going to be on camera he's going to be looking at the interviewer he will never he would never turn around and look at the camera because now all of a sudden you broke the sense of synergy between you and the interviewer. Uh, but there are other dynamics like, and you, you may want to purposefully turn to the camera. There may be an interview at where, you know, someone is saying something and, you know, you could turn to them and go and look into the camera and go, do your viewers out there, do you guys out there believe what just got said? And then you're going to turn back to the thing. But I think it's really important um, and, and certainly posture. But it, the interesting thing, so what I'm just noticing here is for whatever reason, Ken, you look shorter than she does. I, I have a tendency to. Yeah. She does. <laughs> That's no, because I practice. No, no, no. I have a tendency to lean in, and she's actually sitting up. So if we sat up exactly the same. Come here. I'm still shorter. Yeah. Right. I but have a longer something. spine and neck than Ken does, but, but Ken has longer also, legs. But you may, you may choose to put something under your butt because I think that the cushion underneath you is probably softer than the cushion under her so you Bill, look i might just be tinier than her 
you know, you're giants. Bill, not it's when, actually funny that you, you say that up. because- Not when you stood up. Not when you well, stood we, up, because I waited for you to two of you to stand up yeah. so I could see. Yeah. And you are not tall. You are this are roughly the same size. So I think that another thing to think about is if you want to be more of a dominant person in the in the interview, you might figure out how you can sit taller. You could appear to be taller than the it's other person. It's funny that you say this because during our Thursday calls where we sit, it's the same issue. So we always put a pillow under Ken. Yeah, I have a pillow. I have a butt lift. He does get a butt <laughs> So he comes up slightly taller. Here, you didn't do that. But, but Bill, I think you is. brought up, let's go after a couple things first, okay? And that is, I don't know if this is better. I, Because we're all used to seeing ourselves in this facial chest to top of head position because of Zoom, where having a full body, it's a different experience, isn't it? Yes, abso absolutely. And I, for us, for well, for me as a viewer, I don't know what, what others would say, but to me, this is actually a really engaging thing because it's the two of you and you're talking to us. And I feel because I can see the whole you, and I can see all of you, it, I, it feels intimate to me as opposed to like if you were really zoomed in on each other. So I, it, I, I get a sense more of, of your pres of presence, um, you know, than I do if I look well, over at, you know, at not, Mark. We don't, we're not looking at our phones or our computers. We're engaged exactly in the conversation with you. Yeah, yeah. And I, makes, and I, I and it, and it feels, I it and it feels legitimate. Yeah. Like it depends on what is it that you're doing? If I'm doing a one-on-one -on -one consultation with you, it's gonna make more sense if I'm closer to the camera and you see me more eye to eye, right? And then if there's more people in the shot, obviously I think it makes more sense to be a little bit further back. It just depends on what you're gonna do. Like Bill, if you knew that you were gonna get up and do a dance for us, you are too Wait, close to camera. Are you gonna dance? Yes, he is. Bill! <laughs> so it's just about the content. Yeah, I hope, spring, hope spring's eternal. <laughs> like I'm already I'm, embarrassed. I'm already embarrassed because you shamed me because of my casual shirt on. <laughs> but it is 190 degrees outside as soon as I walk. But there's air conditioning. There is air conditioning. I have that on here in, in my office. But but Bill, I, you said real real quick. It is all around the construct of what the screen is. If it's an interview, if Sandy is interviewing me. I need to be talking to her, not looking at the camera when she asks me a question, knowing that's what the audience is. Yeah. Right. It's got to be this way. I agree with that. And in that interview position, because if you notice, generally interviews are two camera shots. Generally. Well, that, the, that's the thing. And in today's, with the Zooming, the Zoom world, how, um, Sandy, how do you recommend um, kind of modifying that interview experience um, with just a single lockdown camera coming straight on? I mean, because right now your posture is really great in relationship to him because you're looking at the camera, okay, your shoulder, you're, you've got great posture, and but you can immediately turn at him, turn to him and have a conversation. Exactly. But we wouldn't feel left out. Exactly. It's all about where you're framing. So if I were to sit like this, yes. so it wouldn't be as comfortable. Yeah, yeah. Like this, no. right? And so you have to sort of put your body in a position that I'm leaning into him, but I'm still open to the camera. Well, that's what I have. Yeah. Sandy, always... Sandy, could you could you talk about knowing what is your best side? You know, every actress, an actor, well, they kind of know right. what is what is your best side. You know, how 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 can somebody really know what their best side is? You know, okay. So I had this conversation recently with someone. There is a good side but there's also what you think is your best side. And most people think because of what they've read on the internet or what someone's told them, their best side is, but it really isn't their best side. So as a photographer, I look for two things. First of all, hairstyle and length, and also how your hair direction is going. So for example, for a woman with long hair, if she has a part that is more on the, let's see, for me, my part today, I don't even know, you can even feel it, it's over here. So this is where my part is. Normally my part is on this side. So for example, if this is where my part is, ideally you would want the hair to frame the face and be open to camera. We call this open to camera. So this would be your side. So this would be my good side for camera depending so on how my hair is. Yes, and then if my hair is on this side, 
my good side to camera would be this way, but depending on if I'm speaking with someone over here. Somebody like Bill and I, myself, we don't have a lot of hair. Well, you actually, your hair parts this way as well. How about Bill? Same I thing. Have, so, I just got it cut. That's your good side right there. So that's ideally when you're just going with how hair is and how a photographer would look at you. But if you really want to know which side of your face is more like even, one. which side of your face is more supple, which side looks overall better, it's the side of your face that you don't sleep on. Okay, let's, let's get a little closer so they can see this. Come on, use my hands. <laughs> Wait till you see this. This is pretty interesting. Okay, I'm going to actually go to full screen, babe, so they can see us on this one. And, okay, so do you know what side you normally sleep on? Do you have any idea what is your sleeping side? Wait, let me, I'm going to zoom the camera up even more, okay? okay? Stand right here so I can see. I'm going to zoom in right. That's where I'm going to be, right there. Okay, this is how you're going to find out what your sleeping side is. Okay. So, to begin, <laughs> you want to take your face or have someone else take your face. You can do this to yourself. And you want to gently go under the jaw, like right about here, and push. So, watch what happens when I push. Do you see the buckling? So the lines that form right here. You can see them, you can see them here. Yeah, so, <laughs> like that. All right, here we go, there we go. So you can see that when I buckle Ken's face, this side actually buckles more than this side. Mm -hmm. So this side is, my sleeping side is his sleeping side. So he sleeps on this side of his face. You can see from where it's collapsing. He's actually pretty even, but you can see that how much dr more dramatic it is right here, as opposed to right here, or just a few buckles, right? Same thing with the forehead. So he's a forehead sleeper. Yeah, you can see him. Yeah, you can see him. Whoa, see what yeah. happens when you sleep? Your forehead crumples. And then you can really tell from here. So watch, right here, you can see how this part is buckling right here more than this part. See how little this part is buckling? So you could tell that this is his not so great side because this is the side that takes all the views, all the hits. Oh yeah. So for camera, I would like probably choose to shoot him on this side, but with his hair, you would have to like pull it up and back. Um, so for everybody, it's a little bit different depending on how they abuse their face. Some people don't sleep on their face at all. So their face is pretty even. So then it's just a matter of deciding which side of your face you like better. For other people, they are definitely even face sleepers. So it might be squished on both sides. So you just want to find the best. Ken actually had a trauma on his face where he was in a major accident. So he has scar from here to here. He has a scar up here and he has a scar across his lip. I love shooting this side of his face because when I shoot this side of his face, first of all, it's the more supple, softer side because he doesn't sleep on it. And I love seeing these details because it gives his face personality and character as opposed to this side of his face, which you can see how it looks a little bit like it's falling Oh, that's here. so boring. And it's so boring. <laughs> There's no character on this side. So for me, I would shoot this side of his face. And in terms of the fact that his hair parts on the wrong side, when I do photograph him, I give him an updo so it pulls this out. Now, if he were a woman, we'd have a whole other conversation. Oh my God, I would never leave the house. I play with my boobs all day. Okay, <laughs> let's zoom back out. So you guys can grab your faces and squish them and see where your buckles are and wherever they break the most, that's the side that you sleep on. Like everyone's doing it. So who wants to go first? <laughs> right. I'll tell you which side of your face you sleep on. Who wants to try? Come on. it's like, not me. <laughs> Come on. You want to try, Mark? Mark, you want to go for it? Come on. I'm a gamer. Okay, Mark, we are spotlighting your video. Let's see Mark. Oh, wait, wait, let me turn off the enhancements here. What, you beautify your video? <laughs> Touch up my appearance is now off. <laughs> All right. All right, so grab from the bottom like this and then push up. Yeah, okay, so you look pretty even, but I can tell that you sleep more heavily on your right side. That side. So just yeah, put this, your right side, side up this side. Push it up. Just use your hand and push. See right there? See where it buckles from your nose to your eye? So go in more to where the nose starts, like where that crease is, like right here. See that? That's where you can see where that buckle is. That's because you sleep more heavily on that side of your face. Now, also wear a CPAP at night. Does that impact it? See, if it's pushing on the skin, yes. Okay. So anything that's going to sit on your skin and push it in a direction that's unnatural for more than a few hours, usually we sleep for six to eight hours. So you have six to eight hours of creating lines and wrinkles on your face all night. 
So ideally, in a perfect world, we would sleep on our backs with our necks gently cradled and we would never squish our faces. Who else wants to go? By the way, Mark, just to let you know, on Wednesday night, tomorrow night, we're going to show you how to get off that CPAP. Really? We're going to show you, yes, we have the sleep doctor with us tomorrow night. And I'm very oh. excited to talk about what it takes to get away from all of that, which is going to be pretty Yeah, cool. me too. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> okay, who else wants to try this? Anyone else game? Oh, come on, you guys. I like seeing all the enthusiasm. Do I ask if I stutter when I can't use my hands? No. You don't? You stutter when you can't use your hands. No, I do. No, Joette says she does. Oh, I do. I do. <laughs> it I happens, I guess. I have a tendency. Harak, let's see your face. You got a young face. Let's see what side Harak sleeps on. Harak, I'm spotlighting you. You're going to go right inside the camera. Let's see you close up, buddy. I'm usually a back sleeper, so let's see. All right, let's, let's see. Take your face and push. Like this? So go from the jaw, yep, and then push. And a little bit higher up on the cheek. Yeah, you're pretty even on both sides. So <laughs> I would good. say, yeah, you are definitely a back sleeper. Yeah, but you want to maintain that. That's good. Oh, wait. wait. Same there. See how even your lines are, your breaks are? They're very consistent. <laughs> That's great. There's your win for the day. Yeah. <laughs> back sleepers rule. Woo. Anyone else, go? Anyone else want to try this? I mean, wait, I got to go to a full screen. Come on. What do you think, Ken? You want to do it? Come on, buddy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here he comes in. Ken's coming in. Ken, let's see your face. Let's get you, you in you, here. You shame me, Ken. All right. <laughs> All right, Ken. Grab here. Ready? Yep, and gently push up. Push up a little more. Oh, boy. <laughs> What's that mean? <laughs> you sleep pretty evenly. You are a rotator, right? You see. I am. Yeah, you are. You sleep on your left side, then you move to your right side, then you go back to your left side. You're pretty consistent. So the way you can tell, see the break right here where your nose is? See mm -hmm. it? That's pretty even on both sides, meaning you sleep on both sides of your face pretty consistently. So yeah, practice I flip sleeping on your back. <laughs> and, and for some people, it's hard to sleep on the back because maybe you get like a tummy feeling that doesn't feel good. So what I do is I actually, because I'm a side sleeper, I will twist so that I'm on my side, but I'll also twist back so my face is not squished. It takes practice, and it'll lead to many restless nights of sleep, but eventually you'll get used to it. Yeah, but you have a pillow, too. What's it called? A sleep, a save your face pillow. Yes. <laughs> if I sleep on my back, she says I snore. She, 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 she won't let me. She pushes me back on my side. See, that's oh. it. And then she keeps pushing you and flip-flopping you. <laughs> like, <laughs> how, does this, right. how does this work with spooning? How does, no, you're right. How does it work with spooning? Hello? <sighs> you get squished face. Yep. And one side won't be Like this side is going to eventually get old looking because all she does is lay right there on me. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> so hopefully this was kind of helpful where we can start paying attention to where what we do when we're out there. Just our presence, right? Sleeping is really important. Tomorrow night is our sleep doctor. We'll dive into sleeping. But the way your face looks is important. We go back to hands. Yes. Look at, no, look what you just did. I want my hands here. Yeah, I love that. I always settle my hands in a position because I'm ready for you. Okay, and that right there is going to be used for what? Are you controlling your hands? Yes. So now when you walk into a room and you're about to give a presentation to somebody, what should you do right away? What is the first thing you do? Yo, 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 yo! That's not what you do. What you do right away, especially when everyone's sitting down because they have a tendency to walk in the room going, all right, I'm about to give a presentation. You walk in and you look at everybody individually. You look around the room. Now, by the way, women that are out there or guys, you got to tell your women this, if you're in the executive environment and they're going to go back into meetings, they can't take notes. No, they can't. Because in most meetings, what happens are, Women take the most diligent of all notes. They're down, they're taking notes, taking notes, taking notes, but they're not engaging in the meeting. They're not looking up, they're looking down. My suggestion is to get their phone out, record the meeting, and then go to YouTube, upload it to YouTube, and put on dictation. And it will take the entire audio of the meeting and take it down to where you could read the entire meeting just by uploading it and put on dictation. Don't take notes anymore. 
go to that and then print it out. And then you have all your notes right there because it's verbatim from what everyone said. So stop looking down at notes and start interacting with the meeting. Really important. So if you're on the meeting side and listening to the meeting, make sure you're looking up. And you can do it, guys or girls, but most women, unfortunately, are always down taking notes. They are the most diligent. They really are. Next, when it's up to you in that meeting, you're walking in, you're walking in and you look around the room and, and smile and say hello. What I have a tendency to do right away is I ask everyone's name. I say, do, do me a favor, please say your name and a rhyme that goes with it. Everyone laughs when I do this, right? It, works, it does work because it breaks the concentration of everyone saying, oh, my name is Bill and then Debbie. And because now they have to think of something that takes them off that track that they're normally on and that's just saying their name. Hey, please go around the room and just tell me what rhymes with your name. And that's just a fun, quick icebreaker, but it also allows you to remember that individual, who they are by whatever that rhyme is they suggested. Quick icebreaker, everyone feels a little better and they lean in to hear what everyone else around the room just said their name is. So it creates an engagement circle right away. Super important because most meetings, let's face it, everyone, everyone is disengaged. They're boring. They are boring. They are boring. Next, I always say, hey, whatever, my name's Ken Rakowski, I'm here. I only have 10 minutes. I know they gave me 15, but I only have 10, and I can't wait to show you what I have in 10 minutes. I set the time parameter, and I set it to be shorter than what's allowed or allocated. Why? It's because I just changed what the audience was ready for, and then it's, ah, oh, 15 minutes, I'm going to kill myself. No, I cut it down right away. So now they're going, oh, wow, he's giving me five minutes of a gift. Cool. He's already given me something. So we want to make sure you offer something. You just did by everyone knowing each other's names. And I just gave him a five minute gift. And while I'm talking, I make sure I'm always looking at everybody. And I will say, Bill, what do you think? Debbie, you okay? John, are you following me? I make sure I always say their names within that conversation. What's going on? They're not disengaged. Because they are thinking, well, Ken might say my name. Ken might ask me a question. Now, if you come to metal when we're all together, nobody falls asleep because they never know if I'm going to call them out in the crowd. And the reason why is I want everybody there. So in those meeting environments, same thing with Zoom, by the way, I would do the same thing. You have a meeting of 10 people in Zoom. I know you see their names on bottom. Everyone, oh, there's their name. Well, sometimes they may not say their proper name. Yeah, well, look at with Kenneth. I, I don't know who his partner is. It doesn't say that. So you use that time to say, what's your name? And a quick rhyme that goes with your name. Do it in these Zoom meetings. Have fun with it. Remember, this whole talk today is about presence, owning your presence, which now comes to confidence. Sandy, I want you to take us for a ride on confidence because this is something you've been studying for a long time. You, when we started dating, you go, I wrote a whole, like it was a whole course of confidence. Yeah. But you didn't have the confidence to launch it. Uh, it was not so much that I didn't have the confidence. I had the confidence. It was, I didn't have all of the little technical elements. The nuances. And yeah. I didn't have the patience. I think it was more patience than confidence that I was lacking. So let's just take one of the courses that you'll be teaching and give us a sample of it when it comes to confidence. Hmm. Well, you've covered a lot in terms of presence, because what we talk about is owning your presence, carrying yourself a certain way, posture, posing. But one of the most valuable things that we can work on when we're talking about our confidence is the chatter that's in our heads. So the negative self-talk, the victim mentality, the mindset that we use, the I can't, the I haven't been able to, it's pretty much those words that we use on a regular. We do this so, all the time when it comes to dieting. I can't do that. I, I can't. I can't oh, give that up. Oh my God. I can't eat all that food. I can't drink those protein shakes. I can't exercise. All. We do this a lot, don't we? We do it a lot. And that prevents us. It absolutely will keep us stuck and it'll eat away at our confidence. People don't realize how powerful the words are that come out of our mouths. I said the other day, if you were to go to the gym, and you were to work out, and instead of looking at your muscles and going, God, I'm not losing weight. I am so fat still. I'm so out of shape. I'm not where I want to be. That's all negative. 
Instead, if we went, yeah, my biceps are showing. <laughs> yeah, you haven't changed since like two days before. But if you say it, you say it out loud, and you look at your body, you're like, yeah, yeah, look at me, I'm looking good. And you start celebrating it. What happens is subconsciously, your brain, your body, your soul goes, oh, oh, wait a minute. Usually she says how fat and ugly and unattractive and out of shape I am. Wait, I'm, I'm, looking, I'm looking good? Me? I'm looking good? Okay, so it starts to go into effect to work and create that actual change. So have you ever gone to the gym and you worked out and the next thing you know, you look way ripped at the end of your workout, which was like 20 minutes? Mm -hmm. <laughs> at the beginning, you did it. It's your brain. Your brain is making these things happen, and it starts to increase your confidence. So by saying this over and over again, you just change the mindset. It's changing the vocabulary, the words that are coming out of your mind, mouth, to change your mindset, yes. I'd like to know in the chat right now, what are those uh, negative things you constantly say to yourself? What are those things that if you get on stage or you're trying to work towards something, put it in the chat right now. What are those, you call them negative chatter? Negative self-talk. Negative self-talk. And Come actually, on. what you just said is a good point. So when I got on stage to do my TEDx talk, I was in Washington, D.C. Yes. I kept thinking, oh my God, I'm going to forget my whole entire step talk. Step back, step back. Let's, let's be realistic. You practiced and practiced and practiced. and practiced. And the day before the TED talk, you had to do a test run. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. So I get up there to do the test run, and the whole time, even though I practice, I wrote this thing, I've been working on it for months, I have people vetted, I've done the whole thing. I get up there and I'm saying to myself, I'm gonna forget my lines. What if I forget my lines? I'm gonna forget my lines. I'm gonna get up there, I'm gonna look like an idiot for everyone, and I'm gonna start shaking, and I'm gonna stutter, and I'm gonna get that thing that I heard about, about the dry mouth, I'm gonna freak out, and I'm gonna forget my lines. And guess what happened? I forgot my lines, I got the dry mouth, started shaking, I froze, and I could not finish my talk. It actually sounded like this. Um, um, that was the uh, test uh, run. Uh, 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 and then, yeah, uh, uh, it was horrible. So I get a call <laughs> the day before going, that's it, I'm giving up. I have no way going on the stage tomorrow. I, I suck. I go, Sandy, you're fine. You're going to make it. And she, you were having a nervous breakdown. I was, going. but I was completely filling my mind full of negative talk. Mm -hmm. And my body went, oh, okay, I guess you're right. We're going to do that. Let's give you dry mouth. Let's give you shaking. Let's give you brain blank out. And it happened. The next day when I got up there, I said to myself, I can't let that happen again. And all of a sudden I heard, oh, my God, my, what if my throat dries up? What if, and I heard the negative self-talk coming in, and I started to mentally correct it. Nope, not going to mess up. Nope, I'm going to know exactly what I'm going to say. <sighs> things are going to be good. I'm going to be up there. I'm going to be hydrated. I'm going to feel really good. I'm going to talk. It's going to be amazing. And when I got up on the stage, I could feel my hands shake. I could feel the negative self-talk starting to seed itself into my being. And immediately I said, what am I so stressed out about? I do this every single time I work with clients. This is easy. Boom. Slate it on stage. Yeah. yeah. So it all goes down to what is the chatter going on in your mind and how do you correct it? Okay, let me just change the whole scenario now. Sandy is about to get in front of 5,000 people. She has broken her toe. She has a bladder infection. Really bad. Her back hurts. And she just does not feel 10. You don't feel like a 10 at all. I felt like a negative 10. Yeah. 5,000 people. Her name is the marquee name. What did you do? When I walked out on stage, I was already shaking. I completely forgot what I was going to say, period. I had no idea. And I got out stage and I said, you know what? Screw it. I know what I'm talking about. I'm just going to have fun out here. So when I stepped onto the stage outside of the curtain, the first thing I did was start to pump up the audience and I started to dance. I said, it doesn't matter what comes out of my mouth. I'm going to have fun. I'm going to get everyone out here to have fun too. And it just boom flowed with the raving audience at the end that all rushed the stage to see me. They did. And the irony was she wasn't the keynote speaker, but she did become the most popular of all the speakers. So just by that negative switch, what are some of the negative things people are saying? All right, let's see. Uh, am I going to come across well enough? What does that mean? Who's saying that? Are you, do you mean by that? It was Kenneth. 
Kenneth, do you mean by that, am I good enough? Is it Kenneth or Ken? And who, who are you sitting with? It's Ken, and this hey, is Ken. London. Oh, hi, London. Hi, London, where are you guys located? Oakland. Oakland, hey guys. Woo! Oakland, good to have you here with us. Okay, what do you mean, good enough? Yeah, am I gonna come across well enough when I speak to people? You know, am I gonna be able to uh, articulate my message the right way? Ah. Based on what I'm Okay, so from what I've heard already, you are articulate. So by putting that doubt in your mind, by saying, am, am I going to come across as articulate? Am I going to come across as educated as, as if I speak well enough? You are telling yourself that normally you don't. So you're already programming your mind to mess up. So the best thing in that circumstance, instead of going, okay, I'm articulate, I'm this, I'm that, just remove it from your mind. When I speak, I do it well. When I speak, I do it well. And get up there and speak. And guess what? If you mess up, that's an awesome story to tell. I have messed up. I've gone on stage on camera and I've said the weirdest things ever that people have teased me about for years. But it makes great stories and we laugh. And guess what? I didn't do that again. I actually can't. I want to say something else. The audience doesn't know when you mess up until you tell them you messed up. Exactly. And this is so important. Oh, no, my clicker's not working. Oh, the slide's missing. The microphone is clicking. They don't know that until you point it out. So don't say anything that's negative. Because once you do that, then they go, oh, yeah. Oh, I can't believe his shoe is not the right color or whatever it is. You point it out, it turns into a negative. So don't. Exactly. The great, best great speakers are the ones that really perform under hostile warfare everywhere. And they're out there. You would never know there's a problem. Do you remember Baghdad Bob? You probably don't. You don't know it. So when the whole Iraq bombing was happening with Saddam Hussein, Baghdad Bob was this, and he, I think he was the head of defense, the defense team for Iraq. And he would get up on camera going, no, everything's fine. It's perfect. And behind him, Baghdad's blown up. I mean, you see the bombs dropping. He goes, no, trust me. It's a beautiful day in Baghdad. Perfect day. And people would watch him going, wow, is he cool? You almost thought it was fake what was going on behind him because he was so cool, confident, and collective. And they were thinking, God, he sounds like Count Dracula. <laughs> no, that's me. I just can't do a good Bag Daddy accent. But Bag Dad Bob owned the stage. It was kind of a funny thing. We would always joke around and go, look at him. But if we could be like Bag Dad Bob, we would be great on stage. So Ken, Whatever you think you are not going to communicate well, almost tell yourself, I hope they understand what I'm saying because maybe it's too complex and you got to bring it down to an easier level to understand. Yeah. Because remember, the key to a great story means everyone's got to follow you through everything. So have that, that beginning, that middle, that start, that hero's journey, which is another conversation. But as long as you tell a great story, everybody is engaged. So just don't get facts. Give story. She already told two stories about her speaking, and we were engaged. But she had a point to the end of it saying, hey, don't self-doubt. Make sure you get out there. You're on the crowd. So do the same thing. Let's see what else we got. Uh, That's hi, great London. feedback. Hi, London. Hi, London. Hey, hello, you, London. You have any stress, anything that you're nervous about when you get out there? Yes. And are you a cop? Because you said you're going to come across as a rookie. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm definitely not a cop. but. Um, one of the things for me, I, Ken and I actually, we do a lot of public speaking engagements. Um, what I tend to, what I see is one of my biggest stressors is that my mind is moving so fast, you know, especially while I'm up there talking and I'm trying to, like, I hone in on a specific point, but then someone says something and my mind goes somewhere else. And I feel like sometimes when I'm trying to then express my point, I'm all over the place. And um, I tend to not get across what I, you know, the point that I, that I want to. And I think that, um, yeah, so it, it discourages me, honestly, to the public speaking. Recently, I've been like disengaged from it because I feel like I've come across that problem often. And um, so London, I, I speak all around the world. And something that I've learned is, as long as you have a, a you can use a deck you know, a keynote, PowerPoint, whatever you use, that there is your bullet points. And in your mind, you always time it out. I have a minute on this slide. I have four minutes. 
in this environment. And I time it out systematically. And by the way, I use the stage knowing, um, especially if you're public speaking, that stage is, it, it helps you do timing. I know if I walk back and forth on the stage, in my mind, one, back, that's 30 seconds. So I know if I walk it three times, I've done it a minute and a half. And that means I have to move on. So I use the stage timing as a place. Marco Tempest, you gotta go watch him. He, he's done, I think, nine TED Talks. Not TEDx, but TED Talks. And Marco uses music in the background to do what he's doing, because he knows where all of his hit marks are with different beats inside the music. It's pretty brilliant. He's a magician. Go look at Marco. But timing is super important because you really want to be under the clock than over the clock, unless they ask you for more, right? So the key is your deck is your timing and your stage is your timing sequence. But that's a whole nother conversation. We'll get to public speaking soon. Yes. Another thing you also want to consider is, does this happen when you're taking questions from the audience sometimes? When you're hearing feedback? It does. Absolutely. Okay. And they're more so, we do a lot of like testimonial work. So we're like, you know, when you're speaking about self, it's, it's easy to get off topic and go all over the place, right? So here's the thing. You are in control of the stage. So if someone asks a question that you're not prepared to answer because you don't want to go off topic, it's your stage. So you can say, I'm going to answer that in a bit. Finish your thought and then circle back around here. Or I'll come back to you for that question. Hold that question. I'm going to come back. Because... You are in control of what you're saying, and if you allow yourself to get off tangent because you know you're like that, then just take your power back and don't do it. Or practice. We as women, we have this magical capability of being what I call diffuse. We have diffuse awareness, meaning we can watch the baby over there, cook the food over here, make sure that the guy isn't delivering something in Amazon, be sending an email to someone while on the phone with our girlfriend, and we're making sure that our man shows up on time. So we can do all of these things at once and we can tell these beautiful stories and come right back to where we came from. So if you're not as diffuse as you think you should be, then it's just a matter of practicing it. So with your friends, start telling stories and go in with an intention. My intention is to deliver this result from this story. No matter where you take that story, you know what your intention is. It helps you come back around to that point. Guys can't stand it sometimes because when I talk with guys and I'm telling them a story and I go on a tangent, they're like, that's not what I asked you because they are like, trying to keep up to my diffuse awareness. But I always bring it right back around. Okay, so we're going to end this. I just want you guys to do something. Go check out what she just put together, Sandy in Focus. Take, um, Sandy Sandy in Focus. Focus. Take the quiz. It's all around your personal branding. Are you naked in your personal brand? I love this quiz. It took her two and a half weeks to put together. Yeah, it's a really it, fun one. It's a super fun quiz, but it tells a lot about you and your personal brand. Sandy in focus, go check it out. And I think uh, you'll have a lot of fun playing with this quiz, but the results are pretty fascinating. So go look at that. Sandy, thanks a lot for hanging out. Thank you, Ken. We're here every single Tuesday. Thanks a lot for being part of the metal, everyone. And uh, we'll see you uh, next week. Bye. Bye all. Thank you guys. Bye.